Mr. Chairman, to you and to the Chairman of the Full Committee, my deepest appreciation. Uh, having become a Chairman of a Full Committee, I understand uh, the problems of trying to fit everything in, and uh, there are a lot of members who would have put this hearing, let's be honest, pretty low on the totem pole, and uh, in fact, would have, uh, it wouldn't have been hard to find an excuse not to have this hearing, and uh, give us the opportunity to meet our responsibility, confront something some people might pretend not to be here. My uh, colleague has given you a very good explanation of, of this issue, although I have to say you get focused um, when she said that people express this as having the feeling they are trapped in the wrong body. I was talking to the chairman of the full committee. Uh, the phrase having something trapped in the wrong body is how we often feel when our legislation goes to the Senate. Um, <laughs> Uh, we, we, we have a lot of legislation trapped in the wrong body. Um, but uh, to get to this issue, and the, my colleague has laid it out. First of all, we should be very clear. The overwhelming majority of legal interpretation is that gender identity is not covered when you ban sexual orientation. Um, it simply isn't covered. And frankly, nobody who thinks it should be covered uses that argument. I mean, if you think it should be covered, if there's any uncertainty, well, let's, put it, let's put it this way. Whenever members of this body object to something on the grounds that it is redundant, I am skeptical. We are a profession, many of us lawyers, where redundancy is uh, part of the code here in Congress. I mean, uh, using a few extra words is rarely something that we object to. So when people say they don't want it because it's redundant, they mean, I don't want it, but I don't really want to tell you why I don't want it. Uh, but in this case, there's no argument for redundancy. Any lawyer will tell you people are excluded. The next argument is, well, it can be disruptive. I mean, these are for people who say there should be equality. Uh, and I appreciated the gentleman from Minnesota stating a principle that I think we all agree with, that people should not be denied a chance to earn a living because uh, of some essential element of their personality that's really relevant directly to them and causes no harm to anyone else. Um, so the argument, though, is sometimes it can be disruptive. I have been, I, I filed a gay rights bill in 1972, unlike my colleague, uh, who, who was both younger and had the chance being from Wisconsin, and she said because of that law, she didn't have to face this choice of, of living uh, uh, without full honesty. Well, I did, and I made the wrong choice for a while and behaved irresponsibly because of it. I was ultimately able to... Uh, to get freed from it. And, and, and let me just say at this point, what I hope will be relevant as people get to know people in the transgender community and as we make progress here, I recognize when I first got involved in politics, if I was honest about who I was, I would have made some people nervous. But they got used to me. I just want to reassure people here, you're going to get used to them. I understand this is new and we're human beings and new and different sometimes make us nervous. But you know, look, uh, Tammy Baldwin and I, early on in our careers, given the nature of prejudice, frankly, in this society, we were seen as exceptions. People were nice to us, but we were exceptions. We were the good ones. Well, we didn't want to be exceptions. And now I think we are not exceptions. We're examples. We're examples of the benefits all around when you overcome prejudice. Let's give the country a chance to expand that experience to people with transgender. And as for the disruption, I filed a gay rights bill in 1972. Um, I have filed and worked for, gay, for, for any discrimination measures, sexual orientation, race, gender, ethnicity, disability. And I, you know, I will address for those who say, well, you can't do, uh, you gotta do all at once. I've, I've never done it all at once. As a matter of fact, for a long time, I have worked for legislation which protected other people, not me. I finally got old enough to, to benefit from age discrimination in legislation. But every bill that I have ever been involved with where we try to ban discrimination has met the same argument. I got nothing against those people. They're okay, but it will be disruptive. I've heard that with regard to sexual orientation, with affirmative action. Certainly, I mean, with not race, looking aside affirmative action, with ethnicity, with gender, with disability. People always say it's going to be disruptive, and it never is. I wish somebody who's got some time would go back and look at every anti-discrimination measure we've ever enacted and see the similarity of the arguments, and nobody goes back and says, well, where was the disruption? 
there almost never is disruption. As a matter of fact, the sad truth about any discrimination legislation, as people know this and people here who practiced it, it tends to be under-enforced because the people who want to discriminate can get sophisticated, and the burden of proof is always on the one who's charging discrimination. So the argument that it's going to be disruptive just doesn't work. The argument that it's already done, it's not true. So, uh, and as to need, you're going to hear from a witness who applied for and was granted a job by the Library of Congress. We're not talking about some benighted institution out in some remote part of the country. The Library of Congress, our intellectual and cultural center, a person was hired, and when that individual told the hiring agent, well, I'm going through a gender change, she lost her job. And she lost her job, and I'm deeply offended by this because the hiring people said, oh, you know what, you're going to be working on terrorism. Members of Congress won't respect you. Well, I very much resent having that prejudice imputed to me and to you. And I hope that the Library of Congress will come to its senses and rescind this terribly bigoted decision. But let's be clear, you ask if there's a need, if this can happen to a qualified military veteran here in the Library of Congress, of course there's a need in other parts of the country. And let me just close uh, personally. And I understand, let's again be honest, I, I realized what, look, when I first realized I was gay, I made me uncomfortable uh, 50 years ago. It's not something, sexuality and difference, they come together, they, they get to the core of our human frailty. But we do get used to each other. And in virtually every case where we have confronted a prejudice, it's worked out fine. And we now boast about the lack of it. We're simply saying this is a new category to some people, but everything that applies in every other case applies here. And for people for whom you think, well, gee, it makes one easy, well, how do you think it makes the people who are themselves transgender feel? Does anybody think anybody would volunteer to engage, to, 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 to feel the kind of tension that my colleague so well described, to feel trapped in, your wrong body, in the wrong body? And these are people who have courageously tried to deal with that so that they can maximize their ability to live the same lives we all want to live. Why would we deny them protection? I understand, as I said, people got to get used to it. But that's all they're asking. Nobody's asking anybody to have dinner with people that make you uneasy or take them to the movies. Let them work. Let them work. People are asking for the right to have a job and be judged on that job by the way in which they do the job. Why should that be considered disruptive? And the fact that they are this or that or the other, uh, it is no more relevant than it used to be about their race or their gender or their sexual orientation. And as my colleague pointed out, American corporations have benefited from this. No one is being given a license to misbehave. No one is giving a license here to be bizarre, although this institution has a tolerance for the bizarre that maybe other institutions would well emulate. But that's all we're asking. So just to summarize, you've heard from my colleague who we're talking about. Not a huge number of people, but they're people who, 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 who first of all had a deep anguish and have courageously dealt with that and, and, and they're only asking to be constructive citizens and to be allowed their personal space but to be judged in their impersonal work, their economic work, solely by their merits. They are not now protected by the law. The argument that it would be disruptive is simply not true. It hasn't been disruptive in major corporations or in those states that have done it. These are people who are grappling with something that many here, let's be honest, are probably grateful that, that, that you don't have to grapple with. Can't you help them? That's all we are talking about. We are talking about responding as a compassionate society knowing that fighting discrimination illegally has worked well for this country to extend it to a group that may be new, that certainly new, may be disturbing to a few people, but there was no more reason to deny them that than there was to anybody else. Thank you.